Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Scrapyard. I am your host, Nathan Meopold. You're joined here by Taylor. Hi. And Xavier. The Atlanta Hawks don't have a single point guard on their team that's healthy right now. This will tie into something later. Today, we're talking about the Overwatch League. Specifically, we are continuing our preseason series of taking a look at three of the Overwatch League teams per week, except for the one week when we talked about four teams. No one's guessed what the subject of that episode will be yet, but hey, if you do, you win nothing. If you want to follow us on Twitter or Instagram to find out when and if someone wins that prize, you can do that at Scrapyard Media on either of those sites. Additionally, you can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts, especially where you're listening right now, at Scrapyard Media. Go ahead, check us out on YouTube. You can listen to the podcast there as well as some fun small clips. I just released one recently. Xavier has a fun one. Taylor coming soon at Scrapyard Media, and you can play games with us on Xbox or Steam at that same handle. What is it? Roll intro. Okay, we are going to jump right into it. We're going to start right off talking about the remaining East Coast teams, starting with the Boston Uprising. Yeah, so they're the worst of the teams we're going to talk about today. They They are, in fact, bad. bad. So, last season, they are 8-20. and uh 41 78 and one map record however i think everybody had some hope this was before the podcast started so we didn't get to talk about you didn't get to have any uh boston's gonna make the playoffs take so you know we're saved off that but they started six and three and then after that they won two games for the rest of the season which was rough rough to watch especially for a team who's was known during the season for their reverse sweep victories so it's like they had four reverse sweep victories last season. And again, for the most part, they're not like they weren't like a terrible team. They just were just outplayed by everyone and they didn't have any driving force behind them. It seemed like they had a solid like coaching coming out of like the first half of a like a set and then going into the second half and then everything somehow fell apart after that reverse sweep victory run. (laughs) Yeah, so I think with Boston, I feel like people didn't start thinking of them as, like, truly garbage until stage four. I feel like there was still some Boston respect, even though they weren't winning. I feel like a lot lot of people didn't include Boston with the Washingtons, Torontos, Florida's. Florida's ranks. I felt like they still had some respect for Washington as, as a scrappy contender, a team that will put up a fight. And I find that interesting that Boston, at least up until stage four, avoided being branded as trash. Yeah. And they I, they successfully avoided it, even though, yet again, they only won two games after their hot start. Mm-hmm. You know, after that, they, they weren't winning, but it definitely felt like when just watching the games they were putting up a better fight than some other teams and i find that very interesting i think it i don't know where it stems from though it it's not even like they were playing a lot of games close i mean you look at their maps you know their games from last <clears throat> last year they were still getting 3-1 pretty regularly yeah. sometimes 4-0'd but i think that early favor that they got in stage one made it so people kind of held on to this idea of Boston. And I feel like people still have some memories of Boston season one where they were actually an elite team. And, you know, teams like Washington and Toronto don't have that history. So when you just start off being trash, you just get labeled that quicker. But Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people have some rose-tinted glasses when it comes to Boston and kind of give them more chances to prove themselves than they may actually deserve yeah and i mean coming out of the season it's one way to tell a team did not do great is a lot of teams will then cut a big portion of the roster and boston did exactly that they cut they cut blase stellar persia aim god calyx almo and rck yeah that's a lot of cuts yeah. boston is the big cut they're the number one team in terms of former players. Right? Yeah. So I kind of expected that they would just ditch their entire team and really just kind of having Fusions and Color Hex as the main remaining key pieces of the team. Mm-hmm. 
and just kind of riding with those two, which is fine. Like, Color Hex is a dope player, and Fusions is the heart and soul of that team. You know, Fusions, I feel like Fusions being in makes everything work. He was one of the standout players from last season. And he has a face. Like, he has a face for bot, like the Boston. Yeah, he's, he's their mascot, essentially. Yeah. Uh, but with all those departures come a pretty interesting roster full of players that I vaguely know, but I look forward to seeing um, in Season 2 and see how they perform. We have Swimmer, who's a main support, and Mufin, who's an off-tank. They're both from their Uprising Academy team. Very good in contenders. Uh, Swimmer got a lot of hype. Mufin was in uh, Team Canada World Cup Trials, and everybody was talking about how Mofin is like, they were talking about him kind of like he was Nevix. You just kind of hear like, oh, damn, he's really good. Mm -hmm. uh, so it'll be interesting to see him kind of show up. Um, Yunbong, uh, Flex Support, and Jerry DPS. I think they're from Gen G, uh, the same team that Glister came from, who's on London. Uh, Munchkin, uh, former Soul Dynasty DPS that kind of played. And then Brusen, who I have no idea who he is, but he's an off tank. And... Uh, I guess their biggest move is signing Mineral, who's the head coach. Uh, I think he's former Florida, and then he started like doing VOD reviews, and he kind of became a big name, and people realized, oh, he's really good at this coaching thing. Um, and he got a head coaching job. So they made a lot of changes, a lot of new faces, and I think that that's important, especially because a lot of their players, they did have in Season 1. You know, They, they did have Aim God, Kellex for a while, and so I think it's good to bring in just a bunch of new faces, and you know, try things out. And right. a lot of the people they cut were people who, like, we would hear over and over again be, like, not putting in, like, enough work, yeah. especially from, like, the casters. It was always just, like, Color Hex fusions. They were they were the ones that were putting and carrying Boston when they did have victories, which was not a lot, but when they did have victories, it was mostly standout plays from these two players. And maybe, like, on occasion, Kellex. Yeah. And interestingly, um... This team was involved in, like... Or, like, one of the first things we ever talked about on this podcast within the first couple episodes was trading Note, who was formerly on the team, for RCK, who was on Dallas. And I think, at the time, that looked like a good trade because Note is just, like, an astoundingly okay player mm -hmm. who's not going to screw up, which is important. And then RCK, at least during stage one and two before two to two became a thing he was valued for his off tank play but also the fact that he could flex on the sombra and he can do a lot of different things for you but when the trade happened um i feel like the sombra kind of got devalued and also when two 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 came in rck became a complete non-factor because suddenly having an off tank that can switch to dps and play multiple roles became kind of useless because he can't do that mid mid map, you know right. he can't immediately be like, oh damn, let's let's try the somber thing. So it didn't work out. So he became devalued because RCK, if you want to play somber, he's taking a spot away from Blase or Color Hex, who are actually great DPS players. Mm -hmm. So I think that trade in, in in hindsight doesn't look as good, and I think that this team probably could still really use Note. You know, if Mofin doesn't work out or mm -hmm. pan out. I think having Note, who's just a dude that's not going to screw up, is always good. I think you just want dudes that aren't going to screw things up for you. So I, 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 I could see Boston kind of kicking themselves for letting Note go for somebody like RCK, when maybe if you wait a little bit longer, you might get a little bit more value because, you know, his skill sets become more uh, applicable now. Yeah, and going further, I don't see boston because one a lot of these are new faces and the people we have heard about is it's like ha have they put in enough effort in other in like soul dynasty or as you said we didn't really see muffin do anything but yeah, he did heard... end up making the world cup roster so right. you know he wasn't there but, but we've, we've, we've heard he's good we've heard he's good but again it's one of those moments where it's like Will Boston bounce back this year? Will these changes actually help them? Or is it going to be the same thing where it's like they look really good at the start and then the further in, the less coordinated they look, the less 
the more showy it gets with like the reverse sweeps which came later and will it actually do anything for them which i, I could I, see yeah. being a problem i think with boston if we if we had this conversation if they announced like the division thing or whatever midway through last season i think we or even before any offseason moves happen i feel like we would be looking at boston as the worst team out of this group and maybe paris being tied with them right mm-hmm. but now the fact that london is basically a team of no names mm-hmm. and they shouldn't be good that doesn't mean they will be bad but they shouldn't be good so london who is now on a downswing paris who has a lot of roster issues as we talked about and they're not getting their you know wonder boy over here at sparkle until way later in the season uh-huh and Toronto, who is kind of a big question mark, I think Boston slots in like a solid three. You know, between London, kind New like... York, Paris, Toronto, and Boston, they are worse than New York. That's uh-huh. a given. Right. I think they're worse than Toronto. But then after that, you look at London and Paris and you think Boston has a more talented roster up front. Fusions, I think, out of those three teams, Fusions is the best player currently Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then color hex has a lot of highs i like swimmer i like mofin and i think munchkin and jerry can kind of i haven't heard a lot about them but from what i've heard about them from fan reaction the signings are very touted Mm -hmm. and and i think that shows something so i think boston could mess around and be like the third best team they're gonna end up being like a gladiators for this side where it's like they're not the best but they're gonna at least show better than possibly better than paris and london with new york being that solid front runner and then toronto being that second man yeah but toronto is just so talented when you have kareev when you have sherfor when you have no no just kareev and sherfor because you can't say nevix because we haven't seen nevix really play and agilities is a big question mark but when you have kareev and sherfor that's more talent than boston has right now Mm mm-hmm so I think Boston is in a good spot. They're going to win more than eight games, I think. I think their ceiling is probably closer to, I think, like, 13 wins. Mm-hmm. I right. could see 13 wins being a solid, you know, getting six more wins. I think you get two, maybe two wins are guaranteed against London and Paris. Sure. If all yeah. things click out, right? That's your wins right there. And then you just have to beat up on the bad team. Mm-hmm. And, you, and you make yourself a good showing. And then it's just like incremental progress. But another thing, I guess, just to close out Boston, who, you know, it's just more of a wait-and-see team. I do think that they're fostering a good team of personalities. Fusions is a big personality. But also Swimmer and Mofin. Mofin is a giant streamer. Yeah. And Swimmer has, one, an incredible story, trying to make the Olympic swimming team and then gets hurt and then he discovers overwatch and he's also just very big on social media you know he has he has a good brand he has a good social media following and i think throughout the season swimmer is going to become one of the more popular players in the league right yes and i think that's cool i think boston last season was sorely missing a true popular player and i think swimmer could be that mofin could be that obviously fusion's can continue to be that especially if he gets to play you know ryan in a more exciting meta yeah. than it was in goats so boston has some upside They're and not i think like playoff team but yeah but i think this team especially now that they've had time to kind of work in an element they were more used to with the 2-2 two, two lock that we're gonna be able to see them actually getting together and again i think they were one of the teams that were really early on with all their trades and like details so they've had plenty of time to go through boot camps with everybody and do like some pretty solid stuff yeah. and and you know there's another thing where we could kind of look at the rest of the league and boston might end up looking i feel like people are, might look down on boston if blase goes crazy in houston if aim god is really really good in washington if kellex is really 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 good in toronto and, and you, you just kind of look and you're like Look at all these former Boston Uprising players mm-hmm. that are killing it on other teams. You know, we already kind of saw that last last time with Stryker. Like, oh, damn, look at Stryker. 
he's on the shock blowing teams up mm-hmm. imagine if he was still in boston and i think that boston might end up kind of screwing up where everybody's just gonna be like i can't wait to see swimmer when he's not, not on boston. boston boston's like the baby step group yeah it's the baby step team you gotta go through boston before you get on like a better Any team a better team oh slow down there la gladiators no 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 that's fake top tier you gotta start with boston buddy yeah exactly they don't hide their shame talking about shame washington justice they had an 8 and 20 record last year 39 72 six map record started the season at two and 18 um stage four they went six and one with the only loss to atlanta they defeated toronto florida vancouver boston houston and paris that stage four was crazy stage yeah. four was <laughs> like I'm, like i'm saying it's a shame they couldn't have been doing that all season <laughs> Yeah, stage was, four was a peak for these guys. The stage four thing, which one, it brought up some of the stupidest opinions I've ever heard from teams where they're like, "Why isn't Washington in the playoffs?" It's like because they were literal, literal they were hot straight garbage. trash the first three stages, two wins in the entire in the entire season up until then. It's like you don't deserve to be in the playoffs when you sucked it up that bad. And there was no way that they could turn it around to get a winning record to get into the playoffs. Yeah, they, they were, were like so bad. They were out the first week of stage four. Like they had no chances of getting even into the play ins. Yeah, and I think a last season felt like a season of excuses. Right. I, I when I think of Washington, you know, you sign Wizard Young, and that already is like all right. Cool. The ex- they blew up expectations before season of like, oh, we have this great coach, blah blah blah. And then they suck it up so bad that there's backlash. You know, there's genuine backlash towards Wizard Young as a coach because he's apparently a genius coach, but he can't lead this roster. Is, is there backlash, Xavier? Yeah. This podcast started as a Wizard Young hate podcast, essentially. And <laughs> then as the season went on, you just hear all these things of like, oh, you know, we didn't expect Goats to go on so long. You know, we built our roster for 2-2-2. Two, two, two. And I do believe, all right, yeah, you you kind of did build your roster for 222 if 222 comes in and you're a monster. Right. But you, I feel like. You have to adapt. Yeah, there's an issue with roster construction where you can't adapt to what's given to you because those first three stages, Corey marginally improved on Zarya. Yanis was still bad. San Sam was awful. Yeah. Their support line was just all over the place. Ark was okay sleepy was okay Gita was okay and it felt like this team just had nothing going for them and then in stage four it honestly just felt it was Corey and stratus going supernova yeah and that kind of pushing them past some of these teams yeah and to bounce off you talking about the stage four like we were building it for the two 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 meta it feels like because there was such a shift in like uh, the third stage where everybody was all like well we're going to 222 it's going to be locked in you're going to have to play this way and then it being like presented as like something where all these teams that basically seem to just like wind their way into getting a way to actually make some wins and it's like not not saying Washington in general but it seemed like teams like London, New York you know Boston, Paris, all these teams were like, well, we we made our team for two two two, even though Paris said they were a goats team. We made our teams for two two two. It's not fair that like we keep getting stomped on by Vancouver and Shock, right? Or and likewise the Gladiators, but not as hard. But it just came off that like the only reason why the entire game shifted to being like it's locked two two two. That is the meta now, is because like. Not just, like, casual players were complaining about getting stuck going up against this, like, GOATS thing, but it was also just, well, this forces this rigid structure where it's like, now you got to find the meta with only two tanks. Figure out who the best two tanks are in this patch. Figure out who the best two DPS are. Figure out who the best two support are. And if a coach is not going to, like, Wizard Young, who was apparently a genius coach, couldn't work before that and it's it's a ridiculous claim and here's the thing i think with goats the biggest thing i the biggest thing i take away from goats is that the best team typically won 
there were upsets, but I feel like in GOATS, it was in a way where the teams were limited in their ability to just completely have one dude carry. Right. I mean, we see that with Florida. You know, Florida, stage four, Sai player and Gargoyle lose their minds, and even with Washington, Corey had some games where he was just a hard carry, and that pushed them past certain things. And then stage three... LA Valiant didn't really find their footing until GOATS loosened up a little bit and it allowed a little bit more of a carry situation. But with Washington, yet again in GOATS, they didn't have the skill set for GOATS. I don't think that they had the coaching to teach them GOATS. Mm -hmm. And I felt like they just kind of ended up punting until 2-2-2 came, which I think... Was a mistake. Yeah, it's a mistake because I feel like you want to put your best foot forward going into the season however stage four is proof that this team is stupidly talented we go six and one and obviously beating toronto florida and boston aren't anything but destroying vancouver is something yes destroying houston was something in stage four and i think beating paris is a solid win you know just looking at who paris is as a team and on paper, before Washington became such a like massive wreck, we, I, uh, I personally thought Paris and Washington were evenly matched with talent. Going further and further into the season, I thought these two teams should be like solid rivals, talent wise. And so they made a lot of changes in the off season. Cut Wizard Young, obviously. Uh, signed John Galt, I think that's his name. Uh, homie was with the Gladiators for a little bit. Mm-hmm. This is their coach. Uh, they cut Fazix, they cut Sleepy, RIP. They cut Ar- Adu, they cut Yanis, they cut Guido, they cut Hayuno, they cut Sam Sam. That's a lot of cuts, and they basically retained, I don't know, like, they're dope players. Right? Yeah. Keep Corey Stratus, and do you really need more? They signed Lolish and Ellie Vote, but they were on the team before. Uh, just visa issues held them up. But, you know, next year is a rookie year. They signed Aim God, who I think is a upgrade over Guido and Sleepy. They signed Roar, who is an obvious upgrade in the tank slot. And mm-hmm. they signed Tuba, who I have no idea about, but I love his name. I do too. It's a fu- it's a fun name. <laughs> Tuba with two T's. I yeah. like it. Yeah. Tuba, I think ha- their team has some like fun names in general, especially the people who they signed. That's like Nathan's dream weird name team come into life. Yeah. Minus McGravy. Take it back to day one of the scrapyard and you'll, you'll get that shit. <laughs> yeah, no, so. it's, a, it's not... Dude, it's not pronounced tuba, it's pronounced tuba. It's not pronouncing the first T and not the second one. Oh, my bad. So, I think there is something interesting with kind of this roster construction. I think Washington is going to definitely be better this year. I see them winning definitely more than eight games, but I don't see them winning more than 16. So, somewhere close around 14, 13. Similar to Boston, I think... I still have reservations about, like, this coaching thing. I feel like, you know, stage four was good, but I think if we elongated stage four out into maybe seven more games, so if it was, like, 14 more games left in the season, I see Washington's deficiencies slowly starting to creep up that we saw in GOATS, you know, just, like, some of the weird stuff with positioning, some of the lack of communication, um, lack of clutch ability within GOATS, and Mm -hmm. I think those would rear their head over a larger sample size. So there is a real big issue with sample size for me when it comes to the Washington Justice. But there's also, you know, having the best player in the game at a given moment. And Corey, more often than not, will be the best player in the game. Uh, You put them up against a lot of teams, especially if this does end up being a sniper comp, and even his Reaper's not not too bad. Mm-hmm. But Corey will be the best player in the game in most given circumstances. And, you know, sometimes you just got to go with the team with the best player, you know, playing right now. Individual talent. Yes. And they have some individual talent. Aim God is a very talented player. Roar is a talented player. Lolish and Elivo, I have no, no, no idea about them, but they've been riding together for a while. Mm-hmm. Like the tank version of Shaz and Big Goose. So that works. But then there's Corey. And I believe, here's here's the hottest of takes, that I genuinely believe, Corey is my pick 
for MVP next year. I think Corey is going to win the Most Valuable Player Award and be okay. the third person next to Jonak and, and Sinatra. I, th- I think he's going to that's be the a, third. That's a really good take. Because you, you look at MVP, and it's not just about who the best player is. If it was the best player, Prof would win every year. <laughs> Shout out. No, but MVP is also just about, I believe, narrative. I think Jonak had a narrative of, I think back then, people just kind of coming into Overwatch League looked at Jonak and was like, oh, he's a support. But he's right. also taking these wild flanks, bloodthirsty. He was on the best team in the league, and that mattered. And with same with Sinatra. I think, obviously, Sinatra was the best team first, but it's not like Sinatra was unanimously the far and away pick for MVP last year. You know, a lot of people were saying Haxel should be MVP. Yeah. Twilight should be MVP. Janu, eh, that wasn't the strongest argument, but I heard, you know, people were very convinced of Janu, but Twilight and Haxel were two people, a lot of people in the league were saying, damn, they, they should be MVP. Right. But Sinatra had the narrative behind him too. Golden Stage, just even his history as a player in season one, becoming so improved in season two just the sheer dominance of his team and his dominance on Zarya and then on Doomfist, I think those outweighed maybe the insane stats that Twilight put up because Twilight didn't have the storyline behind them. Right. And this is where it leads me to Corey, where one, Corey is the best player on this team. This team is basically going to play around him. And if we saw on stage four, Corey is a magnificent player. Highlights every single game. Going into the World Cup, it's a very similar trajectory to Sinatra. Going into the World Cup, Corey amazed people. And Mm -hmm. everybody, even Sinatra himself said Corey should have won World Cup MVP. He was that, Corey was that good in the World Cup. He leveled up three levels. He was insane. Corey pushed his time not being around, like, the other dudes in the Washington Justice. He even, in the, like, little contender scene that happened in Australia when they were down there, he was out of his mind even then and that was him going into the world like that was him basically scrimming to get it like with the world cup so him just showing how passionate he is and how like hard he is at going in for his like his goals it's it's really impressive and i think that cory as you said should be mvp next year yeah and He's... and also i mean washington was awful last season same with the shock The Shock were not good in the first season. Sinatra basically leads them to this promised land. Right. And Corey has the potential to do the same thing. I think they're just going to win four or five more games. But if they end up a 16-17 win team and they explode onto the scene, that's another big narrative push where Corey, coming off this big World Cup, you know, leads his team that was the laughing stock of the league last year to, my favorite team <laughs> to a playoff berth that's big right. and that's my case for Corey being mvp i think they have the san francisco shock the anime arc that the san francisco shock had this year i think washington justice will have this next year because yeah. the losing streak that shanghai like that kind of arc is going to be this like triumphant triumphant scrappy yeah. kind of go get them team yeah Dragged and, along by Corey. And MVP is never about the best player in the league. It, it, it has never been in, in any sport, you know. Otherwise, Profit would win every season. <laughs> no, but, like, even last year, like... No, I know. Moth, I believe, is... Moth or Choi... No, not Choi, because Choi wasn't that great all season. But Moth... I believe Moth was the MVP of the San Francisco Shock. Oh, hell yeah. But Sinatra had the storyline behind him. Yeah. Profit was an MVP candidate. Jonak was an MVP candidate. But... Voter fatigue. You know, like, the MV- yeah. the best player doesn't always win MVP. Yeah. It's also a combination of narrative. So, Corey got the narrative behind him. Uh, and hopefully... He gets it. Yeah. But them winning MVP is contingent on them overperforming how I think they're going to do. Yeah. I think they're, like, 13-14 wins. But I that's think... still good. That's, like, a lower... That's, like, a, what, 12th, 11th seed in the playoffs. That would have been last year. You know, a couple wins breaking their way. But they should... They should be a lot better. I, they don't have Yanis driving their team down. Yeah, and I feel like Washington Justice will come in this season as like more of a fan favorite. Yeah, but if they For do, sure. if they start off rough, it's gonna be bad. Yeah. Like if they start off like and o, o and I think O and three is when you start to panic. Yeah, and I think Washington has like 
was one of the first teams to come out and be like, we got a bunch of, like, games. They have, like... For, I think they got, like, I don't want to say six home stands, but they got, like, a gang of home stands. Yeah. Yeah, they got a, a, a certain amount for a team that... They need to be good. If they're not good, it's those bad. home stands are going to be whack. Yep. Yeah. So Washington has a lot of pressure on them to perform because, you know, they're... We're going to be seeing a lot of games in D.C. That's true. And I don't know how, you know, how that might go if they're 0-10 to start the season and fans are like, why the fuck am I going to go watch Washington this season? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why am I going to go watch them lose? For sure. But going from a team that had a rough season to a team that's been pretty great since the inaugural season, New York Excelsior. My other favorite team. They went 22-6 and six last season with a 78-38-3 and three map record overall for the season. They started the season 12-0. and 0. Their stage 4 record was 3-4, where they defeated Rain in the playoffs and then lost to both the two top teams, Shock and the Titans, mm-hmm. cementing themselves in third. Yeah. New York is one of those teams where like you can never call them fake top tier because they're genuinely top tier. But I think New They're York... They're generally a good team. Yeah, but I, I think New York is is one of those teams that can definitely be overperformed. Like, yeah. you know, I, New York has been dominant. Like, not... None of this is to disrespect New York. New York is the top three team. And there is literally no indication until they prove otherwise that they're not going to be the third best team in the league. Right. Because they are. Because they're, they're the shit. They're the winningest team in the entire league. Their record all time is 68, 66 and 12. Okay? 66 and... Do you understand how ridiculous that is? They've only lost 12 other than playoff games or regular season games. 66 and 12. And even if you add in postseason, it's like what? 66 and 16. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> so they are the winningest team in all of Overwatch. And I think they're going to stay that way. They're going to extend their lead to fucking 80 something and whatever. It's they're a fine. ridiculous amount. But when you think about New York and kind of where they're going in forward, the league's getting better. And last season, I felt like they had some struggles when it came to performing against the very best, which was the Shock and the Titans. I think the Shock right. and the Titans had their number the entire time, and it, and it showed in the playoffs. You know? mm-hmm. yes. even, even their playoff win against the Rain, I don't think is much to care about. Because yeah. the rain shouldn't have been there anyway. Yeah. <laughs> right. If, if we're being honest, the rain the rain defeated the shock. They pushed in the seven map, which is wonderful. But in the grand scheme of things, the rain they're shouldn't sh- have been in that position. I can't believe they got to that position. Uh, that's that's the insanity of it. Yeah. And so that victory, with the given context, is less impressive than it would be if they defeated the shock or the titan. Yeah. yeah. Even the glad, you know, somebody. But yeah. defeating the the rain is like. It's a good win, mm-hmm. but it's not the team you should have yeah. beaten. So, and then any other time New York came up against Vancouver, the shock, it was not very close. Yeah. You know, they had upsets against Seoul way back in, I think, stage one. They, or no, stage two or one. They had the big upset against Seoul. Mm-hmm. And that was another game where Fleta just went far and New York was like, I don't know what to do. And I think New York is slow to kind of come around and adapt mid game. Yeah. So New York they um, cut Pine, Mecco and Flower, which to me is an, is something is, is yeah. but I I do want to point out that I think what I was missing from New York is a face. They don't really have that other than Jonak. They don't really have I was like wait a minute, homie. Is but this they, another Nene thing. Up. No, no, no. Wait a minute. No, no. They don't Nene. really They don't really have other than Jonak that like a presented face like sure they will be well yes but i'm saying like they don't have the dude that they're like really pushing to be their hero i mean new i feel like new york last season felt more like a collective yeah and i i I and everybody got some shine yeah and i i I appreciate that but the thing is that even then with what they were doing it just felt so lackluster like as you said a lot of their victories were not victories where you're like oh wow they did it because it's just like to be expected and they didn't have like one game where i was like this is that shining moment because when it came up to it to where they should have had that like big shining moment it like against the shock or against the titans it would have been like now that's the new york excelsior that i know 
but they never had that moment to prove how much of that top tier team they are and i think that's why they got overlooked for the fake top tiers the gladiators because the gladiators had those insane wins against teams where you're like oh yeah no they're a top tier team and that's what even the casters kind of fell behind well here's the thing new york had the easiest strength of schedule last year they factually you know statistically they had the easiest strength of schedule so their record is unbelievably impressive because even if you're playing bad teams you still have to beat those bad teams but they did have the easiest strength of schedule and i think that that makes us just kind of blow by just you know 66 and 12 you blow by just some of their oh new york's gonna win new york's gonna win and you focus in on those big games where it's like all right this is your time you're playing soul you lost this is your time you're playing you know vancouver you lost this is your time you're playing the shock you lost yeah Mm -hmm. and those stick more because their schedule is fairly easy that every game you're just kind of like that's a given that's a given that's a given and they're so consistent those given games aren't upsets so because they just defeat the they defeat everybody they're supposed to defeat yeah so i found myself not watching like a bunch of the new york games i would rather put it on later into the stream maybe when they're already in their like final two maps where i'm like cool now i'll just you know, watch these final two maps, get enough, and then go in to see the next game. And I felt like they always played during the earlier time of the day for the matches and never, like, the second or third team to come in. Yeah, because they stomped <laughs> yeah. their team. Yeah, but it's, it was just one of those things where it was like, oh, I, I, I didn't see the New York game because, I don't know, I just knew they would win. And so New York was... has, a has, like, a... One, their division isn't strong mm-hmm. this year again. So, London, those London games, they're going to 2-0 London this season. Yeah. They're going to beat London both times. Paris, they're going to beat Paris both times. Boston, they're going to beat Boston both times. And then Toronto, yo, they're probably going to beat Toronto both times unless Toronto pops off hard. Right. So, London, so they basically already have, what, six wins that are given? Mm -hmm. And then you have the rest of the league, which are given wins as well. So, you just look at those things and you think... This is another season where New York is going to just chug along, be great, and maybe this is the year where they actually win the title. Maybe the league is more wide open where they have that ability to stun a San Francisco Shock or Vancouver Titans. It's been two years, they've had two cracks at the apple, and they haven't been able to get over that hump, even though they were the best team in the league, or the third best, or the second best. You know, first season... They were better than Philly yeah. or London. Just shit happens. Yeah. Right. However, they did sign some pretty dope people. They signed Hotba, who is. Don't get me started on Hotba. Uh, they signed Who Are You, who's an OG player, uh, played in like Apex, Ooh. and he just kind of never made it into the league. I think he was in the league for like a little bit. But the he, name is familiar. No, no, he's a, he's a dude that like everybody knows. He's his name's really familiar, but I don't know if he was in the league or if he was just like league adjacent. No, he was definitely in the league. I I, I want to say Soul, but I'm not entirely sure. I'm, I'm sure we're getting screamed at right now. Uh, Bianca, who's off tank, and Mandu, who's an underage main support. But here's a here's what I like. One signing, who are you? I mean, he's DPS. They already have <laughs> a lot of DPS. Yeah, <laughs> that's like their thing. But Who Are You is way better than Pine and Flower. And so I think Who Are You is going to contribute more. So now when you do your weird Nene, Libero, Save You'll Be kind of rotation, instead of bringing in, like, Flower, you're bringing in Who Are You. Yeah. And I think that that's a big change. And now think... they have four undeniably top-level DPS instead of three undeniably top-level DPS and then Flower. or it's And a... then Pine. It's a positive, uh, it's a positive trade. Uh, growth. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I like that. And I also like signing Hotba. who, all right. So Xavier loves Hotba. So, you know, there's this thing called punching up, right? You never want to punch down. I'm punching up. So I'm pretty sure it was Sideshow on Plat Chat who besmirched the good name of Hotba. And I see a lot of people besmirching Hotba with like, these weird takes that yet again feel very oh the phantom menace was a good movie type takes where i think there's this pushback to hotba 
you know, kind of being a top level off tank, which I find just ridiculous, absurd. Ridiculous. So I'm a, I love the Guangzhou charge, right? <laughs> I watch a lot of their games. I, I, Happy is the goat, fifty percent crit accuracy. What's up? Shu is like B level Jonak. I, I love the whole thing. I love all that they going on. I Guangzhou lean... charge is one of like my favorite. They're, 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 yeah. I watch all their games. They're the I go back to watch their games. They're so fun to watch. Fun thing when we get to Guangzhou. I didn't. Re- I forgot that they started the season off so bad, <laughs> and they like started popping off late. But you know, watching those old Guangzhou games, it's like, wow, when will this team ever figure it out? <laughs> and it's like, oh shit. But you know, they ended up the season really well. But yeah. Hotba, his Roadhog performance was incredible. And I think his diva was also very good. I and, recall, yes. And what I like about Hotba so much is when the metas kept shifting, he stayed really damn good. And he would just pick up these heroes in a Choi Hyobin X esque fashion mm-hmm. and master them. And I value that so much. And I think that New York needs that kind of thing. You know, I think that they have so many DPS because their DPS aren't super versatile. Outside of Sabio B, who is fairly versatile, and then Libero, who is, yet again, a Libero, can do everything. Correct. They don't have a lot of versatility. And same with their tank thing. They've only had one tank one, one tank in each role, one support in each role. And now they have Hotba, who is a very versatile off-tank. And I think that they could value that versatility, where Mecho, very good, but I think Hotba... Yeah, I think Hotba is just straight up better yo like yeah. mecha wasn't that great in stage four right. and mono sucked it up in stage four because he was forced to switch but hope was a dude that comes through whenever the meta switches and also i like that they signed a, <laughs> a goddamn another support and another off tank yeah. yeah yet again what were they doing like right. <laughs> it's still it's crazy going back and looking at like last year's new york roster it's just all dps and it's like it's all dps for a meta that was goats for so long and, and two I'm, of which you're not playing you're, you didn't play flower the entire season yeah. basically yeah and then it's like you have and it, it didn't really register to me that they only had mecho and mono and then their support john and all, yeah john and yeah and that i was just like oh shit they only got these t- these like four dudes playing these roles it never occurred to me how heavy they were on the DPS like it's, front. It's weird, and it's like <laughs> for a t- for looking at other teams like the Vancouver Titans and then like the Shock who had like at least Some one depth. other person yeah. or at least somebody who could go on support. Maybe they weren't known for being a support, but they could be on support. They had somebody that could flex onto that, and then you look at like New York and you're like, oh shit, all they got is all they got is these guys, don't they? Yeah, like, it's mono, mono eats some shitty sushi, and uh, their season is over. Yeah. Flowers, fucking Libero's out here playing main tank. So I like that. And it, and this is the Trey Young thing I mentioned at the beginning of the episode. The Atlanta Hawks went into the season with literally just Trey Young as an actual point guard on their team. And they were just like, yo, screw it. We're just getting a bunch of forwards and be totally fine. Trey Young gets hurt. They, they don't have a point guard now. And New York avoided that. Of, oh my god, our dude got hurt. <laughs> our dude can't play. What are we going to do? They avoided that. And I think they looked at travel schedules and just the potential for burnout popping up. Where they're like, you know what, we should probably get somebody that can come in if Mono isn't playing well. And I think that they were hurting themselves because Mono on Arisa was not good in oh, stage Oh, that four. was the worst. And... I think that they would have liked to have somebody come in on Arisa. You know, the Titans mm-hmm. had Tizzy come in because Bumper wasn't really good on Arisa. The Shock had Smurf come in because Super wasn't good on Arisa. And that type of versatility set them apart from New York because New York was just riding the same things over and over again. So if Mono sucked, Mono just sucked and you just had to deal with it. Mm-hmm. But now, Hulkba, I don't think he's going to suck at anything. And if Mono sucks a little bit, maybe you can start trying to mess around with like Hulk but doing something or you know, like you you have a little bit more versatility to play with the meta but i just like Hulk but too like I, I think he's dope and bianca i don't know who he is but you know i like the name yeah it's 
I, I, I like the name. I think that this is finally a point where I'm like, this is their excited time. Excited to see an uh, NYXL game because there's like I said, there's so many where you're just like. You're like, well, they're going against Florida, so why watch? Oh, they're going against Washington, why watch Dallas yeah. again, Valiant again? We know they'll probably beat the Gladiators, so it's like, there was no point in watching. Yeah. And three years in, I feel like this is a testament to st- the stability of an organization. A lot of Overwatch teams are just like, flip their roster over and over again, and you know, there's there's not many stable teams with cores that exist from season one. And obviously, if your team sucks, you just gotta switch it out, but... I feel like it's also important to kind of maintain some stability, like the Shocker doing going into season three. That it's the same group of dudes, but New York. I mean, they've had Mecco, rest in peace. But you know, going to last season, they had Mecco since the beginning. But now they have Jonak, Mono, Animo, Sabiel B, and Libero, who have been there since jump. And mm-hmm. I, I value that. I value having Animo and Jonak be such a well-oiled machine. I value Mono being so stability. I value Sabiel B being a leader on this team that has been around since the start. So when new players come in, like Haltba or Who Are You, who's not really a new player, but, you know, or Bianca or, or Mandu, Sabiel B is the leader that can push them, you know, right. help them integrate. And then Libero, I think he's just another player that's so valuable to have. And then obviously Nene has been around for forever. So yeah. you just have a good, stable group of players, and that's going to pay dividends this season or in the season four or yeah. season five. It's going to pay eventually yeah and i was saying i would hope that more teams take the nyxl example of where it's like we have these senior players who want to still play jonak and jayhong have said that they would they'll play until their 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 hands literally like cramp up and stop so it's like i'm glad that the there's some teams that are taking that and they're like we will keep you or we will appreciate you, like the Titans said, we will take you in, we will appreciate your seniority. Unless you're Bumper. Yeah, unless you're Bumper. <laughs> but, you know, we'll take but you yeah. in, we'll, we'll we'll give you that seniority. And I think more teams need to look at this example where it's like, you need these dudes who have been on this team for like, at least a year to two years now. But like, the longer you go, you're going to want more of these players to be like, still around. So that you can have these people who have like, hey, this is, like, what we went through when we had the same kind of scenario when we had that loss, especially when there's going to be more te- new teams joining the league with future seasons and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, but New York is, what, probably, like, I think I think they're just going to win, like, 22 games again. 22, 21, yeah. give or take, like, plus one or two. But I think if I was a bet man, I'd probably just set their over-under at, like, 20. Maybe they drop, like, two more games to, uh you know, some of the teams that are coming up. Maybe mm-hmm. they drop a game to Toronto. Maybe they mess around and lose to the Justice if Corey's having a really good night. Um, there's a lot going on. Oh, yeah, uh, with the Justice, I forgot to give some shine to Stratus, but, like, don't for, like don't think I meant to disrespect Stratus. He's dope as fuck. Yeah. It's just, you know, Corey's the dude. There's a reason why Corey But Stratus, has... Corey and Stratus are a duo. No. Yes. Any compliments to Corey can only be complimented because he works well with Stratus yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. Which is what we say with like Jonak and Animo. But you know, Stratus like ain't going thing. Stratus ain't gonna be the MVP. Yeah. Corey's gonna be the MVP. Hold me to that. Lock it in. Lock it in. For sure, one hundred percent Corey is MVP as according to Xavier. Yeah. Close to up in this one. On this day. Yeah. December thirtieth, before going into the new year. Yeah, so those are the three teams. I think today's teams or have significantly brighter futures than last week. Yeah. And oh, I think, definitely. And I think they're going to be this more fun. This is a fun. breath of fresh air to talk about these yeah. teams. <laughs> yeah, more fun to watch. Uh, next episode might be a little bit more dour. But we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. We'll... Speaking of dour, you won't feel sour if you listen to this ad. Cold. Cold darkness. Is that what you want to feel? Or do you want to feel unified? Unified by watching a man fail to beat the Lady Butterfly boss in Sekiro over and over again. Hey, if you want to come watch me play Sekiro, uh, Shadows Die Twice, I will be doing that probably the day after this video goes up if everything goes right. Thursday, Thursday the 2nd. You can come watch that stream. Uh, It will be fun. It will be streaming on the scrapyard media twitch i'm playing it on xbox one uh if that stream 
goes well if we get some participation and I just really can't get past that boss, uh, maybe we'll just hop on like Call of Duty and I'll get some people from the stream in the game. You don't know. It might go crazy. But speaking of Call of Duty, let's get back from this ad. <laughs> Hey, thanks for bringing up Call of Duty, me. Xavier? You wanted to speak about COD. Yeah, so uh, first of all, Black Ops 2 isn't the best Call of Duty, it's Black Ops 1, so shut up. Like, of this decade? Like, I feel like people think 2010 wasn't a part of this decade, but it was. And it, was mean, it wasn't even released January 20, 2000. It was released November. You That's... could you could be one of those people who's like, the decade doesn't start in 2021 and whatever that fucking well, shitty take. A decade is 2009 to 2019. That's how everyone does it. Everyone, every movie list or whatever, every all decade list you watch is 2009 to 2019. Yeah. All NBA decade teams, 2020, 2009 to 2019. All your favorite movie lists, are probably 2009 to 2019. It's just how it is. That's 10 years. Like, stop. Anyway, um, so Modern Warfare is out. And so my PlayStation's broken. Uh, and I'm probably not going to get it fixed for like another month. Or get another PlayStation for another month. Um, but, you know, Nathan got an Xbox. And we were playing some Modern Warfare. And keep in mind, I haven't played Call of Duty in, in a hot minute. I played like bits and pieces of each Call of Duty. And none of them ever, like, really stuck with me or interested me. But, man, playing this multiplayer in Modern Warfare feels good. <laughs> like, even quick play, but, like, specifically realism, which I just love. I love I love the lack of HUD. I love how focused it forces you to be. I, I love how it feels like in realism, obviously in quick play this is the same thing, but it feels like in realism the differences in guns kind of hit different you know you're you're using the m4 versus the p90 they hit different compared to when you're playing in quick play i think everything's a p shooter in quick play once you've played realism yeah. it's really bad and it's not like hardcore i feel like hardcore just gets frustrating sometimes but realism i think strikes that perfect balance between you know letting your guns hit crazy but then also keeping it a game still Mm -hmm. And I think it, I think it plays towards shit like Rainbow Six and stuff, where how these shooters are kind of lining up, right? A more realistic style of shooter where things have weight and they feel yeah intense. And it may be because like maybe I haven't progressed far enough into the game where I would know this, but like in realism, having different mods for your guns, like leveling your guns up, you get you know different attachments and stuff like that that do improve the guns in different ways. But it hasn't felt like a single time where there's really been a thing where it's like, oh man, I got the right fucking muzzle flash hider, and now my bullets are better bullets, which is really nice because, like, regardless of how long you use a gun, just because you put a better suppressor on it doesn't mean the bullets kill better. So that's uh, realism. It's just it just feels good. Also, weird take. Why is co-op so hard to do split screen, but multiplayer isn't? So like, similar. it's so weird. Like, you can go straight into a multiplayer game running split screen co-op. You gotta like jump through hoops and shit. It's really strange. So I love the multiplayer in it. I think realism is such a brilliant addition. But even quick play is still fun. And I think the biggest differences between this and like Advanced Warfare and World War Two was like all right, but we don't talk about World War Two really. And like Black Ops Three, I think. This game is fast, but it's not Titanfall, which I think that they kind of lost their way in, like, advanced warfare and trying to go all futury, and it just felt like Titanfall, but, like, not as good. But this Modern Warfare, when I play it, it feels really fast and, like, the type of Call of Duty that I love. You know, it's a fast, twitchy style of, of gameplay, but it feels significantly more weighted, I think movement feels a lot better than it did in like advanced warfare and stuff and i think it's that perfect balance between that quick twitchy style of call of duty gameplay from like modern warfare 2 mm -hmm. with modern fps tactical style of of weight and gameplay and thought behind how you have to move it does feel physically better to play yeah but um, it, it definitely reminds yeah. me of modern warfare 2 just the speed of it yeah uh, it, it, it hits like Modern Warfare 2. It doesn't feel like... I felt like Black Ops was slow. 
Uh, Black Ops 1 was definitely slower. World War 2, they significantly slowed things down. Um, Modern Warfare 2, which is my favorite Call of Duty game ever. Um, it feels like Modern Warfare 2 with that speed and, you know, I think each gun having a distinct personality behind them. Mm -hmm. And I will say, playing through the campaign, campaign was enjoyable. I mean, like, it wasn't groundbreaking or anything. It was, you know, go stop terrorists from terroristing. Murk. But, like, eh, SAS, so. Not America. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Britain. Those but not really. Nah, but it legitimately, it was. But no, legitimately, it was fun. It was entertaining. I'm sure there's people who hate it for some weird reason, and I don't understand. Or, like, there's something I don't get. But, I mean, it was fun. Um, spoiler alert real quick, so maybe just, like, shoot five minutes ahead or something. It is a reboot to the franchise. If you were, like, that's not surprising at all, but it's a reboot to the franchise for Modern Warfare. And I feel like it's not a bad one either. Like, that story that you liked with Price and Soap and all of them is still there, but here's, like, a new one that takes place now so it's still modern warfare <laughs> like it's just it was fun it was enjoyable yeah and bouncing off it i enjoy this modern warfare a lot like when i get my playstation again modern warfare is like the first game i'm getting and i'm gonna play it stupid amounts of time um i genuinely enjoy playing it that much the little bit i've played it and i think it makes me more interested in actually watching like competitive call of duty now because the game is so fun to play and I think it looks so fun to watch that when the Call of Duty League does happen, which I still think is like, it's like a, I think it's dumb, but I also think like it has the potential to pop off low key. I'm going to watch it, you know, because Modern Warfare is a cool ass game and I've watched, you know, I've started watching YouTubers I've fell off of considerably, uh, specifically Hutch, the OG of the OG Call of Duty YouTubers. Uh, that's still kicking. Shout out to CNanners who has like an adult job now. Uh, but you know, like Hutch, and, you know, he he'll play with like Mr. Sark and like, but now he plays with like Nade Shot and Doctor Disrespect and stuff. And watching Hutch play Call of Duty, he's kind of echoed a lot of the sentiments that I have. But obviously, his from a more expert opinion of Modern Warfare being so fun and so addictive to play and how it feels significantly better than Call of Duty's have for the majority of the decade and i think that and i think that you know hutch and a lot of other people talking about how good modern warfare is to play um makes it feel like modern you know the call of duty league is going to be worthwhile to watch that when i sit down to watch it, i'm going to see some like crazy gameplay i'm going to see really fun you know team dynamics and all that and I might get sucked in. Mm -hmm. You know, th there's a reason why I'm not sucked into Dota or League of Legends or Counter Strike because I don't find those games super fun to play. So I'll watch them, but I'm not like jumping up and down excited to watch them. But with Modern Warfare and Call of Duty League, the game is so damn fun to play that, you know, I might just be like, damn, Call of Duty League's on right now. Let me sit down and watch it all day after I've watched way too much overwatch league mm -hmm. you know it, it, it might factor into my viewing and i i enjoy that it's similar with rocket league rocket league's so fun to play that i watch competitive rocket league uh fighting games are so fun to play so i watch competitive fighting games modern warfare smacks though you should play it i think it's pretty cheap right now if you have gold by the way so probably same thing with like psn yeah and it's way better than like advanced warfare or black ops 3 or any of that bullshit yes the middle of the decade was bad for call of duty man oh yeah it was rough rough time i remember when like it, i think it was advanced warfare was dropping right at the same time as battlefield one everyone was like well <laughs> there it goes and then um yeah battlefield kind of owned the, like the mid and the end part of the decade yeah battlefield beat the shit out of call of duty well like it was like battlefield 3 was a god and then people were really contentious about 4 and then hardline was the same way it was very divisive mm -hmm. i enjoyed playing it it was like a spin-off though yeah, yeah it, it was, was like fun. a serious thing. it was very fun um but it, it was a good game to just chill with, like, a homie and play. Mm -hmm. Like, drive around in a car yeah. and just hang out a window. Battlefield 1 was big. Battlefield 1 yeah. was fucking amazing. Battlefield I 5 still... still people, people whine about Battlefield 5, but they still, like, play it a lot. Yeah. Like, no matter how much they still complain, they're like, I'm gonna play it, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it sucks, but, like, I still got, like, 3,000 hours on it. Like, I'm sure it's very fun. <laughs> I haven't gotten the opportunity to play it yet. That might be yeah. a game I I have it. I played it on a PC for a little bit, and I really enjoyed it. Um... It's like a just neat ass game. Yeah. But I've never been like a big fan of Battlefield. I'm more of a fan of Call of Duty. I like the 
twitchier style of FPS more than mm -hmm. a slower, methodical Battlefield. Oh, and I will say Ground War with Modern Warfare, since that's literally just Battlefield, but you're playing in Call of Duty. Yeah. Um, it I've played like one or two rounds of it. It's enjoyable. It feels very similar to Battlefield with the like spawning at hard points and all that and just running and trying to, you know, okay. maintain things. But it has that twitchy feel. It feels a lot faster paced. Vehicles don't actually feel like they play such a big role in it. And from what I'm remembering, you still have like score streaks and stuff or kill streaks. I don't remember which it is in that game mode, which is really entertaining and fun. And you also have the whole thing where they have different like operators you can play as which doesn't really change anything but it like does because some characters depending on what gameplay like or what game mode you're in they just like visually are harder to detect like you're playing night mode and someone rolls up as otter and you're like oh shit fuck yeah it's it's fun remember that dumbass hub world they had in world war Two? in call of duty world war oh yeah that was the worst thing they've ever done this entire decade regardless of like i think it was zombies and black ops 2 was pretty bad advanced warfare was just a mistake but that Ghost. hub world and world Ghost, whew, I Ghosts. forgot all about that. Uh, but the hub world and World War Two was awful. Like mm -hmm. I, I stopped playing World War Two because of the hub world and the menus were so cluttered yes. and hard to navigate, and everything was just like, what's the point? And Modern Warfare's HUD is, or like menus are kind of cluttered because there's like the battle pass stuff and like mm -hmm. there's a lot going on, but it's so much easier to just like you know. It feels so much easier to just be like, oh, I'm in a game. Yeah. I'm doing my thing. And, and it's not as absurd as Modern Warfare or World War Two, which is just like, what are you guys doing? Like, yeah. why are you doing this? Honestly, you know what? Here, Here's how I put it. If you, going into the game Call of Duty Ghosts, thought it was going to be an amazing game, Modern Warfare is what you thought Ghosts was going to be. That's the best way to put it. Roll outro. <laughs>